Hello. In a few days, the Chancellor will tell us what he'll tax and spend. His choices that will affect us all. He's here to explain this morning. First was the emergency. What's next for the economy with recession on the way? It's not going to be easy. There are going to be some very difficult choices. I've used the word eye-watering before, and that's the truth. We can't carry on like this with growth lower than our competitors. The government can ill afford more political embarrassment. Sir Gavin Williamson has posted a letter. He is resigning from government. Rather than take on the bullies, he lines up alongside them and thanks them for their loyalty. Yes. Money talks, yet money's tight. But being trusted on the economy is top of this pair's list. We have one big question this morning. What will the autumn statement bring? The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, is here and we'll be talking to him in the next few minutes. Along with the woman who wants his job, Rachel Reeves, Labour's Shadow Chancellor. And on this Remembrance Sunday, I'll be joined by the Chief of the Defence Staff, Sir Tony Radican. And don't miss that. We will mark this notable day looking ahead to the Remembrance Service on BBC One with something truly beautiful. And with me at the desk to help us out through the next hour, the editor of the Financial Times, Rula Khalaf, the country's economic referee, Paul Johnson, the head of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and at this big moment for the country, the historian and TV presenter, Simon Sharma, is here too. Good morning and a very warm welcome. Over the next hour and 15 minutes today, we've got so much to discuss, including dinner with Elon Musk, what we can learn from the American midterm elections and what is really happening with the war in Ukraine. Then at 10.15, we'll hand you to the Cenotaph for live coverage this morning on BBC One of the Remembrance Service. But you don't need me to tell you how choppy things have been when it's come to the economy. And in a few days, the government will announce how they hope to make the sums add up. We have carefully chosen a panel of experts to help guide us through what will happen this week. And we have some of your questions as well for the Chancellor and the Shadow Chancellor. But first, Paul Johnson, you're an independent number cruncher. You've studied this stuff for a long, long time. How big is the task for the Chancellor this week? The Chancellor's got some really tough choices. I mean, the Bank of England has told us that we're in recession and likely to stay in recession for some time to come. In those circumstances, you usually want to do something fairly loose fiscally. In other words, maybe cut taxes or increase spending to support the economy. But uh, we've also got, obviously, the highest inflation for more than 40 years. The Bank of England has had to raise interest rates, partly because of the, I think we can say, disastrous mini-budget of a couple of months ago. And because growth is very low and inflation is high, then uh, we're going to be looking at very high levels of borrowing and debt over the next several years. So it's a pretty ugly picture. I mean, really, at the Financial Times, you look carefully at the UK, but also the rest of the world. How does the UK compare? Because we're not the only country having a hard time, but... But what is happening in the UK is being watched all over the world. Um, I think unlike many other autumn statements, what the Chancellor has to do is not only convince the UK, but also convince his allies and the world uh, that the US, uh, the UK uh, now is fiscally responsible. Uh, what happened with the mini budget was that the most important thing I think that happened with the mini budget is that the UK lost credibility. Mm. And there was concern that the turmoil in the market could spill over. This is why we had the IMF intervention, for mm -hmm. example. So I think this is an unusually 
important budget and unusual, for the world and not just for the UK. Unusual time of pressure. I mean, if you look at the front pages this morning, it's interesting, actually, they're not all going on the economy. The Mirror can't help themselves but put Matt Hancock in the jungle on the front page again. <laughs> the Telegraph's talking about um, a migration plan and the BBC website's got information about the US midterms, but they're the Observer and the Express taking a very different view of what should happen in terms of the economy. Um, Simon Sharma, from your perspective, does it feel to you that the country is at a junction that this is, as the others have suggested, a really uniquely difficult moment? Well, it, it certainly has to be a uniquely difficult moment because actually we're the only country that's not got back so far to the kind of level of growth pre-pandemic. So um, I, I would also say um, to introduce um, a terrible profanity these days, the B word as in Brexit, um, that it could be the moment, you know, we're not allowed to say anything about that because we mustn't litigate it all over again. Has Brexit actually made these decisions even more difficult? But I would say to your point, Laura, that um, we are at a juncture, but it's a juncture we've seen again. It's a very profound historical one. The relationship between social responsibility and the responsibility to the markets. And the category one, of course, is all about where spending cuts mm -hmm. will hurt the most. So this is an incredibly tricky issue. If you actually do the bidding of the markets as they absolutely want mm. and direct spending cuts so savagely, you can generate another wave of social pain and political anger, which you're not quite prepared. Well, we'll get into lots of that with the Chancellor, who, Jeremy, has an unusual start in that job. He was rushed in by Liz Truss after she sacked Quasi Quarteng. When the markets had a pretty violent reaction to this. Mr. Speaker, we are at the beginning of a new era. And as we contemplate, and as we contemplate, that's right, that's right, a new era. Well, Mr. Hunt almost immediately ditched every single measure on that tax cutting budget, warning all of us on this programme that things were looking pretty grim. He was brought in to be Mr. Sensible after some wild weeks in Westminster, so no surprise. When Rishi Sunak moved into number 10, he kept the man next door. And since then, he's had his head down, squirreled away in number 11, putting together what he's already described as an eye-wateringly difficult set of decisions. But he's with us now this morning in the studio. Thank you for coming in, Chancellor. Um, you've been explicit that we face difficult decisions. That's often code for the fact that everyone's going to have to suffer somehow. Is everybody going to pay more tax? Good morning, Laura. Um, we are going to see... Uh everyone paying more tax, we're going to see spending cuts. Uh, but I think it's very important to say that we are a resilient country. I think that, as Simon Sharma would say, we've faced bigger challenges in our history in the past. And we're also a compassionate country. So we will introduce a plan that will see us through the very choppy waters that we're in economically. Uh, but we'll make sure that we protect the most vulnerable uh, and in particular deal with the single biggest worry for people on low incomes, which is the rising cost of their weekly shop and rising energy prices. And economically that makes sense too, because as uh, Paul Johnson was saying, inflation is much higher than it should be, and that is destabilising people's uh, family finances, as well as being very bad for and businesses sure we'll, in the we'll economy. We'll come to that later, but explicitly at the outset, people are going to lose some of their public services and people, everyone you say is going to pay more tax. So everyone is going to notice the consequences from the decisions you're going to announce on Thursday. I think people will notice because these are difficult decisions, but they will also see there's a plan to get through this. Um, and if we do this wisely, we can make this uh, recession that we may be in as short and shallow as possible. And that's certainly what I'll be trying to do as Chancellor and I, I want people to understand that although these are difficult decisions, uh, we will be doing it in a way that means that we get through to the other side. Uh, but as a country, I think we know that the way you deal with problems is by facing into them, not by pretending they're not there. But as and a, I want to give people the confidence that we are actually doing that. But as a country, though, we go into this in a worse position than most other major economies. Is that because the Conservatives have mismanaged the economy for the last 12 years? Well, there were some mistakes with the mini-budget, and I corrected those within, I think, three days of becoming Chancellor. But, but I this think is it about be more a... than the last decade. I mean, yes. these problems didn't come about during 44 days under Kwasi Kwarteng and as trusted they. 
Exactly. And um, if you look at the last decade, actually, we've had the third highest growth in the G7, the, the biggest global economies, and unemployment is at a 40-year low. But the headwinds we face are being faced, for example, by Germany, which is predicting a bigger mm -hmm. fall in GDP as a, as a result of the global energy crisis than, than we are here. You're seeing higher inflation in the Eurozone and in countries like Germany and Italy. Uh, in America, you're seeing taxes go up by $800 billion. So these are global headwinds. But and I am very confident that the British economy has some very good fundamentals that will see us through this. At this moment, in a worse position than those other economies that you've mentioned. We can show viewers this graph that shows every other major economy has got back to the size that it was before the pandemic. We have not. There we are, the UK lagging furthest behind. Now, every major economy has had to deal with war in Ukraine and energy prices. Every country has had to deal with the demands of the pandemic. Why are we lagging behind? Isn't well, that down to what's happened in the last 12 years on your watch? Well, I think that is one snapshot, if I may say. This year, we've actually got the fastest growth in the G7 of all uh, the major countries on that list. So we're catching up uh, fast in that respect. But do we have some issues as a result of the pandemic? Yes, we, we seem to have about 600,000 more people who have left the labour force. And we need to understand why that is, because that's creating constraints for businesses that are finding they can't employ the people they need to. That's absolutely something I'll be talking about on Thursday. And what I want people to see is that we have a, a plan that is not just to deal with the short term pressures of these very high energy prices that are causing, causing such worry to families up and down the country but also a plan to grow the economy, to make us one of the most prosperous countries in Europe, which of course is what we need if we're going to fund the NHS and our public services. So we'll see both parts of that. We'll see a plan that deals with the short and, term and, 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 and gets people, us in good shape for the future. And people will be eager to hear that on Thursday. But as you know, we've asked our viewers for questions. Let's take the first one from Marie Casey. Now, Marie, Marie says, can we have an honest assessment of where the problems in the economy lie, including an honest assessment of the impact of the Brexit agreement we signed? She goes on to say Brexit is the thing that cannot be named. What do you say to Marie? Well, Brexit is a big change that the country voted for. And whether it's a success or not is up to us whether we embrace the opportunities of a different type of economy to one that we would have been in uh, as part of the European single market. I believe we can make a tremendous success of it, but it's not going to happen automatically. And what you'll hear on Thursday is some of the ways that I think we can make a success of it. But on that point, you're suggesting that, that it hasn't happened yet. I mean, do you deny that Brexit has meant the economy has grown less slowly than it otherwise might have been? What I don't accept is the premise that Brexit will make us poorer. I think it has oh, that an was opportunity. My question, yeah. It was at this stage, we're the only major economy that has made it harder for businesses to trade with our nearest trading partner. Barriers were introduced. Now, I'm not saying it was the right thing or the wrong thing. It's what people decided. But as an economy, we made it harder for many businesses to trade, to do business. Do you deny that's had a cost? I don't deny there are costs to a decision like Brexit, but there are also opportunities, and you have to see it in the round. And I think what happened with Brexit we is made because the most of we. We opportunities well, yet, though? Since then, we had literally within months of formally leaving the EU, we had a once in a century pandemic, which has meant the process of outlining what the opportunities are mm -hmm. has taken longer. But, but you, I think we need to do that now because we've decided why, to do it and we need to make it a success. But do you think that's part of why we are behind compared to some other economies? I don't think that's the biggest issue. I think is it's it much issue? more to do with, well, I think it's much more to do with other factors in the labour market that I want to think about. But what I want to promise to everyone is the decisions that we take will be honest about the problems and will be fair in the approach we take because we're not just a compassionate country, but this is a compassionate conservative government and we need to demonstrate that in the way we approach these decisions. Well, let's talk about exactly that and that overall approach. The economy is in a bad place and you keep saying there'll be difficult decisions. Let's listen to Andrea Cassius, who's the head of a primary school. What practical strategies would you advise head teachers to use to balance their budgets in light of non-funded pay rises and huge increases in gas and electricity prices? And please, could I respectfully ask you not to begin with the phrase, we've put more money into schools than ever before. Thank you. 
I think Adria should be interviewing politicians. So without saying you've already put more money into before, what do you say to her? Well, the first thing I want to say to Andrea is that I think that our heads and indeed our schools have done an incredible job in the time that my party has been in power. We've seen a very dramatic rise in school standards. And I think our state schools are often as good or even better than independent schools. But so, that's not her question. She I wants know to not. know, as a head teacher, inflation is tearing into her budget. Are you going to give her extra money? Will government departments get extra money now, this year, to deal with the cost of inflation? Or are you going to, as everyone expects, tell them they've got to stick with what they were given in 2021? Well, as you know, Laura, and I think Andrea knows, uh, I'm going to announce the decisions on those things on Thursday. But what I want to say to Andrea is that the progress we've made in, in state education has been extraordinary. And we want to make sure that uh, nothing happens now that undermines that progress because strong public services, including a strong education systems, schools, further education, are actually very important to the future of the economy as well. Do you acknowledge well. that if schools and other parts of the public services do not get extra cash to deal with inflation, they are going to have to make decisions that mean services suffer and taxpayers lose out and people who rely on public services are going to lose? Well, what I would say, Laura, is this. Schools, hospitals, all our public services are having to deal with the cost of inflation. And so what Andrea and what everyone running schools will see is a government that has a plan to tackle the root cause of those pressures that she faces in her school, which are the bills going up, the electricity bill going up, the gas bill going up. And what we need to do is a combination of, of short term support for people who are really struggling and absolutely schools and public services are in that category but also a plan that says this is how we're going to get through this. This is how, for example, on energy, which is, I think, often the biggest worry for schools, mm -hmm. it's not just the support that we give you this year and next year. It's also the long-term plan mm -hmm. to make sure that we can bring down energy prices to much and, and lower levels, times, cleaner energy, The number of times I've heard a government so minister say we'll have a long-term energy plan is about the same as I've had hot dinners, or maybe not quite, but not far off it. I mean, people are talking about things that matter to them right now. Now we've got another question from Trevor Littleton, who's a campaigner for elderly people. He asks, and I know this is an issue close to your heart, will you as Chancellor ensure delivery of fully funded social care to reduce bed blocking and the NHS backlog? Will you do that? Or will you, Chancellor, as many people fear, delay the cap on social care costs that Boris Johnson promised for taxpayers and families in England? Well, again, without explaining to you now what I need to announce uh, properly to the House of Commons on Thursday. I, I, will, I think I've spent more time involved in uh, the NHS and care system in my time in frontline politics than in any other area. And, and the one comment I would make about, uh, about that question is that you cannot separate the NHS and the care system. They go hand in hand. If, if you have a, a care system in difficulty, those problems end up in hospitals very quickly indeed and so we have to think of those two sectors together and we have to recognize that yes we're we're, we're putting a lot more money into the nhs um, but there are real pressures there because the number of older people is going up and we have to recognize that in terms of how we help the nhs but would you this acknowledge and i know you don't want to give us specifics but would you acknowledge that if the care, social care cap is delayed there's going to be a lot of disappointment and potentially a lot of extra hardship for people. Of course, and I don't want to pretend that there aren't going to be lots of difficult decisions that disappoint people, but I think what people will also see is that this is a government that is committed to helping people with the greatest difficulties and committed to our public services and is taking a balanced approach. And, you know, the, the big question people are going to ask is if we are actually in recession, are these measures making the recession worse or better? We want this to be as short a recession as possible, as shallow a recession as possible, if we're in it. But we don't have the option of doing nothing because uh, we saw with the mini budget, you heard what Paul Johnson said just now. If we do nothing, the Bank of England will then increase interest rates because they have to do that constitutionally. It's their job to bring down inflation. If we don't help them with what we do as a government, 
they'll have to take that pressure and we'll see mortgage rates go up, interest rates go up, and that will be damaging for families up and down the country as they see their costs increase in a different way. And, and I think the big point I would make, conservatives know that a dynamic economy needs low taxes and sound money, but sound money has to come first because inflation eats away at the pound in your pocket or pound in your bank account every bit as insidiously as taxes because it pushes up the cost of your weekly shop. Except everybody is going to pay more tax. Public services are going to be reduced. I mean, you keep saying it's difficult. You keep saying we have to do this, but you do not have to do it like this. And I want to, we will come to your plans for energy a bit later. But one of the things we know you're going to do is freeze tax thresholds, and that's why everybody will pay more tax. Um, it's a bit sneaky to do that, isn't it? Chances have done it before. You won't be the first one to do it. But essentially, millions of people will be paying more tax, even though they're not putting their taxes up. Why don't you just call it a tax rise and be honest about it? Laura, you're being very artful in trying to get me to confirm elements of the package that I announced on Thursday, as I would expect from you, um, but I'm not going to do that, I'm afraid. It's not about being artful, um, it's a but, question but, of the but principle I, well, I want, of, of well, freezing Well, that's what I want to answer, thresholds. Yes, I want right. to answer the principles. The principle I approach is that I'm not going to be hiding anything I do. You know, I'm a Conservative Chancellor, and I think I've been completely explicit that taxes are going to go up. And that's a very difficult thing for me to do because I came into politics to do the exact opposite. So I will be honest, I will be fair, and it will be a balanced approach that recognises that uh, the economy is struggling at the moment, businesses are struggling, families are struggling, and we need to help people through a difficult time whilst putting in place the long-term plan that gets us through to the other side and allows our economy to take off as I really believe it can. Well, you've mentioned energy there. Can you confirm you're going to tell us what will happen to people's energy bills on Thursday? I know you won't say what it is, but you are going to do that. Um, right now, the prices are capped for everyone. We expect you're going to change that. In April, could the average family again be facing bills of three, four thousand pounds? I will explain the support we're giving. I think it's very important that we do support energy bills. I think this was something that Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss got absolutely right because their price cap... But for who, just, Chancellor? For who? This is I, the question. I will come to that. The, the, because their price cap uh, didn't just help families that are very worried about energy bills. It also brought down inflation. So it was the right thing to do. It has to be done on a sustainable basis. But the point I want to make is that a, a proper energy policy. I know you've, you say you've heard politicians say this many times, but a, a proper energy policy isn't just about the short-term support, it's also about showing people credibly, and I stress the word credibly, that we have a plan that means that we can bring down the price of energy on a long-term basis. And that basis. may be very worthwhile in the long term, but what people want to know this morning is what will happen to their bills in April. Right now, everyone is getting support. That will come to an end, won't it? Well, I will be announcing what will happen from April on Thursday. I'm not going to say now what that is, but uh, will we continue to support people? Yes, we will. Uh, will it be uh, uncapped, unlimited? Uh, we have to recognise that one of the reasons for the instability uh, that followed the mini-budget was that people were worried that uh, we were exposing British public finances to the volatility of the international gas market. So there has to be some constraints to it. But yes, we will continue to support families and I will explain exactly how we're going to do that. But the average family or just the most vulnerable? I mean, when you haven't got much money to spend, you could quite understand a Conservative Chancellor saying, I'm terribly sorry, we can only afford to help people who are really, really struggling. But energy costs are so huge at the moment, many people who would normally see themselves as being somewhere in the middle are finding it extremely difficult to pay. Yes, and I, I'm not going to say what, what I'm going to announce, but I do recognise that the people who are struggling are many families, not just families on the very lowest income. Uh, and we do understand those concerns. Have you ditched Boris Johnson's long-term energy plan that he announced not so long ago? Um, I think Boris was great at having a big vision for the future. Um, there was sometimes an element of cakeism in, in, in what he announced. And so what we need to do is to make sure that we can deliver the, the high ambitions that he set out, which were absolutely right, with a practical, credible, affordable, deliverable so policy. You're, so, so you're ditching it because it was no, a, a, a fantasy? Is that uh, what you were saying? No, uh, I'm actually saying the opposite. I want to deliver the exciting things that he outlined, but I need people to believe. You were saying to me earlier that you've heard endless ministers saying they're going to do uh, motherhood and apple pie, and you've, you've sort of stopped believing it. I want to present something that 
the hard-nosed Laura Koonsberg looks at and says, actually, I believe this is going to happen. And for energy policy, that means recognising there's a global energy crisis and we need to make sure that uh, dictators like Putin are not able to put up our energy and gas bills in the future as they are able to at the moment. Well, we'll watch carefully exactly what it is you announced on Thursday. Um, but just as we come to a close, you've said repeatedly this morning and in, in the last couple of weeks that you know, there is no alternative. You have no choice. You have to act in this way. That's not actually true, is it? Because you could try to pay the debt down more slowly. You could put taxes up much more. Or you could, as some people in your party on the right think, well, cut tax. Some of them think it's crazy to be increasing taxes when we're in recession. You do have a choice, don't you? This is a political choice. We have choices, of course. And we will make those choices honestly and fairly. Um, but what I would say to people is that, um, unusually for a chancellor, uh, I come into office uh, having just tried two months earlier, under different leadership, exactly the things that some people are advocating. In other words, a plan that doesn't show how in the long run we can afford it, in the long run we will start to bring down our debts. We have tried that. Mm -hmm. We saw it didn't work. We've learnt from those mistakes. And so now is a chance to put in place a plan that does stand the test of time. And for me, that means recognising that families are struggling but also recognising that businesses want a plan for the future that can give them confidence that the UK is a great place to invest in, that we have big opportunities and we're going to be a fantastic and successful and, and economy. And just briefly though, would you blame some of our viewers this morning who might have been listening to you carefully and saying, Tory cuts, here we go again? Well, I think austerity as it's often characterised, uh, particularly by people who don't vote Conservatives, is a, is a sort of willful choice to make things worse in the short term for some long-term gain. That is not going to happen. We uh, want to do, as I say, everything we can to make this recession that we appear to be in as short and shallow as possible. We are accepting there will be difficult decisions, but we want to do it in a way that's fair and recognises the pressure that families up and down the country are okay. under. Chancellor, it's great to have you in the studio this morning. Thank you very much for coming in. We'll listen very carefully to what you have to say on Thursday. Now, let us know what you thought of what Jeremy Hunt had to say this morning. Let's find out what our panel reckoned to it. Rula Kalaf, the editor of the Financial Times. Paul Johnson, the independent number and cruncher from the IFS and the historian um, Simon Schammer. Um, Paul, what do you reckon? That sounds for code of something that's going to be very painful, potentially for a very long time. Yes, and I think that's what we've been hearing from uh, the Chancellor for some time. It's very striking, isn't it? He kept saying everyone's going to be paying more taxes. Now, that could mean anything from we'll keep to the freezing of the income tax rates and allowances that's already there to some substantial additional taxes, whether it's a reintroduction of the national insurance increase or actually if it's genuinely everyone paying more taxes, mm. the only way you do that is actually by increasing... VAT. So it's striking though to hear that from a Chancellor saying yes every single person in the country will pay more tax. Rula? Yes I think that what you hear so th this is on the negative side. On the positive side what I hear from the Chancellor to today and is, is a relief is that no more fantasy economics here. Um, we are going to be fiscally responsible and there will be pain and we will try to spread the pain um, across. Now, two things that I think are not being said yet um, in this sort of new era of, of transparency. One is that the Chancellor has to overcompensate for the mini budget mm -hmm. and for the impact of the mini budget. And that is a much higher, the, the cost today is much higher than it would have been a month ago. So the public might suffer more or pay more tax because, because of the mistakes. Of mistakes. That Liz exactly. Quasi -quasi made. Absolutely. And the second point is, and I think um, you, you tried to address this, um, is Brexit. There is this Brexit is the elephant in the room. There is no debate today about the, the cost of Brexit. Yes, there are opportunities in Brexit. We haven't seen them yet. But by focusing only on there are opportunities in the future and not discussing the cost of Brexit, I think that, that there is more room for transparency. That's what I'm trying to say. Simon, what did you make of hearing a politician speak like that? I mean, he's made a big play of being honest. I'm going to be straight with people. It's going to be tough, but I'm going to tell you the truth. What did mm. you think? 
Um, well, it was the male fist inside the velvet glove, but the velvet glove was very velvety. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jeremy Hunt's speciality. <laughs> no, I thought, as, as uh, Paul and Marilla have both said, um, and you, you know, took up the point about uh, Brexit, it, that it, 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 I think this will actually generate a new debate, not least because... Um, the, the Chancellor did um, say, well, inflation has a lot to do with the cost of labour. Well, of course, issues on the supply chain and the cost of labour are not entirely unrelated to the fact that agricultural produce is rotting in the fields, that NHS staff is, has been wounded by the lack of a belt that's pushed up um, real wages. So, so the two things are kind of interestingly connected. Um, and I say just one other thing about is that um, uh, you know, during the, over the course of the interview, uh, he went from standard conservative view that we are absolutely committed to helping the most vulnerable to more or less admitting that the most vulnerable is the broad, enormous middle class. Well, we'll spit so, with interest. Yeah, so the broad middle Thursday. class suffering the pain are going to have to pay more taxes, but they are also people who are waiting eight hours for an ambulance. Isn't it true, though, Paul, as the Chancellor said, that given what's happened since the, we left the EU, the unprecedented crisis of the pandemic, things happening with supply chains because of that, global economic turbulence somewhere, everywhere. Isn't it true to say that actually it hasn't been possible to see the opportunities of Brexit yet? And isn't there also a risk for people who are on the other side of the debate to be a bit sort of gleeful and say, ah, ha, ha, well, it was all because of that. I was right. Well, of course, not everything that we're facing at the moment is because of Brexit. I mean, there's been a whole series of things that have happened since then, not, not least the mini-budget. And the irony of that mini-budget, which was intended to be a tax-cutting budget, as exactly as Rula says, is that taxes will be higher than they otherwise would have been because mm. we need to get back to that credibility. That's the real irony of, of that. But in terms of Brexit, it is absolutely clear if you look at investment or if you look at trade, that has had a substantially negative effect on the UK economy relative to other economies, and that is part of the problem that the Chancellor needs to deal with. Is it the case, as Simon picked up, um, and it seemed to me, that the middle class is actually going to be hit by all of this because of these tax thresholds being frozen? Is that what's going to happen? Well, everyone's being hit at the moment, and we're seeing possibly a <clears throat> almost record reduction in real household income record. over this year. I mean, certainly if you look at the current projections, what's happened to real household disposable income in the next year or two, that's, that's falling. Because obviously wages are rising, but they're not rising as fast as prices. And at the same time, taxes are rising. So all of that's hitting households. And with the freezing of tax allowances and further tax rises, yes, I mean, the chance it couldn't have been clearer. Everyone's going to be hit by and this. And Rula, what do you think that will do to our politics? I mean, it's a pretty tough sell, isn't it? Well, this is this is the big trick, right? Because on on the one hand, they they don't have a choice. They have to both raise taxes and cut spending. Uh, but what what they need to do is be able to tell a slightly different story a year from now because we have an election. So I think what will be very interesting and what I'll be watching for is how much is front loaded, how much is, is back loaded, right? Because it, it wouldn't be a bad idea from their point of view politically is to to leave a lot of these increase tax increases to to uh, backload them, mm -hmm. and then per possibly and then you might saddle labour. Find that no, the rules uh, the rules can bend after all, or you might saddle labour with them. Well, we'll be talking to Rachel Reeves from the Labour Party in just a moment, but you mentioned elections there. I want to talk about the U.S. midterms, mm -hmm. which always take ages to count American election results. Now, it looks like, Simon, that against the expectation of the pollsters, mm -hmm. the Democrats are going to keep the Senate. They may not also lose the House. So these are the equivalents of the Lords and the Commons, although obviously the history is pretty different. But just to explain to people the upper and lower House, what do you make of what's going on? Because I know you watch American politics very keenly. I do, I do. I, I, I live in the lower Hudson. Valley. Um, well, this is an extraordinary day, really. It's, it's a vindication um, of American democracy, in a way. And I only say that for one crucial reason. Um, in, in the 1970s, Hannah Arendt, the political philosopher, wrote a wonderful essay called Politics and Lies. And she made a very interesting point, very much out of left field, that lies are exciting. They motivate you because you have a sort of weirdly 
kind of politico-erotic relationship, really, with the manipulation of the truth. <laughs> truth is much harder to defend. You're pompous on the back foot, um, conservative with a very small C. So the Trump rally was the model of we, the, the election was stolen, mm. um, it was rigged, and so on. And what's been extraordinary about this election, and nobody, including me, thought would happen, was that in almost every case, except a few cases, the most vehement deniers of the truth, the election truth, have all been defeated. And beyond actually the extraordinary fact in itself that this is the best record an incumbent president has had for more than two decades, mm. there is this sense in which actually democracy, American democracy, which is thought to be on life support, has been taken off it. One more small point, Laura, sorry. No, long-winded Simon. Is that, um, <laughs> is that remarkably, even fiercely Trumpy politicians have conceded, unlike Donald Trump, who has yet to concede the election of two years ago. Except that it's still too a very tricky remarkable. picture for the Democrats, though, isn't it? And Justin Webb, actually, our colleague, has got a very interesting piece in the Sunday Times this morning saying, actually, we realize this is the Democrats' worst nightmare because it means that Biden will feel vindicated and Joe Biden will definitely then try to stay on as president. He will run again. Is that a problem, briefly? Uh, it is a problem, but I would suggest that uh, we all focus on Jill because it's very possible that Jill will tell him not to run. Really, you think? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I, th I think there's a big chance that he doesn't act end up running, although he told us he would be running. But you think But he Dr. did Biden say his wife also very specifically to. is he will be discussing it with Jill. Yes, family consultations. OK, well, let's see about that. It'll be fascinating to watch if that comes to pass. Um, Rula, briefly, um, Elon Musk has also been in the news a lot. Um, he's too bought much. Twitter. <laughs> he's been in the news too much. He's certainly <laughs> given you and other people a lot of headlines. You're one of the few people in this country that has recently spent some time with the billionaire Twitter owner, rocket man, whatever else you want to talk to him. I just have to ask, what's he like and what's he up to? Um, he's like, I think the way I described him in, in the dinner, he's, it, it's like two, two people it's, uh, combined. On the one hand, you have um, uh, an inventor, a builder, someone who, can, who has, has a mission and, wants, and, and will fight for this mission. And on the other hand, you have a sort of a kid, a troublemaker, <laughs> mischievous, who don't, doesn't really believe in, in rules, uh, doesn't really believe in the rule of law itself. Uh, and the combination can, in some cases, bring genius and in some cases bring disaster. Did you and like I think. Him? I was intrigued. <laughs> very I was diplomatic. intrigued. Very, very, very that intrigued. Could be a yes or a no, it's nicely very handled. Curious. Um, Paul, we're about to speak to Rachel Reeves, um, the Labour Shadow Chancellor. What, what would you, how, how do you think she can position herself here? We've heard from Jeremy Hunt already. What do you think Labour are trying to do here? Well, they've got a really difficult position, actually. I mean, if, if Labour win in a couple of years' time, it's not going to be like 1997. Back in 1997, when Labour won, actually the Conservatives, what have you thought of them, spent five years essentially repairing the public finances and the uh, economy was in a pretty good position and that left Labour with plenty of opportunity actually to spend more and to uh, do things with, that, that they wanted to do with public services. Come 2024 or 2025, that's not going to be the position. Uh, we, we, we've seen the economy is likely to be in a difficult -ish place, possibly recovering, but the public finances not with lots of money around. So if Labour want to do a lot of the things that I think they want to do, mm. they're going to have to think quite hard about what they're going to do on the tax side as well. And of course that's a very difficult sell before the election because miserable sods like me um, when it comes to their manifesto are going to say well how are you going to pay for all this? Oh dearie me well you've described yourself as a miserable sod and Jeremy Hunt said I was hard nosed let's see how, how, how many insults are going to be flying by the end of the show let's see then what Labour does have to say this morning we've heard how about the choices the government is making from Jeremy Hunt we've heard that it's not going to be a pretty picture on Thursday thank you so much for your questions you sent in for him and remember you can still get in touch today with any of your thoughts or questions you can email us at coonsberg.co.uk or use the hashtag BBC Laura K or follow the conversation on the BBC live page at bbc.co.uk forward slash news but we have questions from you for Labour too and we can join Rachel Reeves from Leeds she's there today rather than in the studio because of a remembrance service in her constituency later so welcome to you Rachel from Good morning, Leeds this Laura. morning. Good morning. Um, do you agree that there's going to be a big hole in the government finances in the order of tens of billions of pounds? 
Well, it is disappointing that we still don't know the state of the public finances. The last Chancellor gagged the Office for Budget Responsibility, so we haven't been able to see the details of what our public finances or the state of the economy uh, are. But I think there are two important things that I'm looking for from the Chancellor on Thursday and that I would prioritise if it was me as a Labour Chancellor making the autumn statement. The first is about fair choices to um, manage the public finances. And the second is a serious plan for growth to stop us languishing at the bottom of the global league tables of growth and instead see some of the big opportunities uh, for the industries of the future and investment and jobs here in Britain. But do you agree on principle, Rachel, that there is this gap, this black hole, as some people call it? Do you agree with that assessment that whether it's a Conservative government or whether you became the Chancellor tomorrow, there is a gap between what the government is expecting to have back from taxes and what they're able to spend. But there is clearly um, a, a gap. We don't know the scale of it yet, and that is disappointing. It's why I've already started setting out some of the tax changes that we would make and we would prioritise. Uh, for example, the Prime Minister is flying off to the G20 summit later today. There is already global agreement to get global multinationals to pay their fair share of taxes in the countries in which they operate and you know some of these global multinationals they can afford to fly to space but they can't afford apparently to pay their taxes here on planet earth that needs to change and under labor it would we think it could bring in for britain uh, up to seven billion pounds a year so that's one of the choices that we would be making in an autumn statement this week and there but are also just on the issue that we've discussed in fact, on many occasions, Laura, around the windfall tax, the Prime Minister, when he was Chancellor, slow pedalled on introducing a windfall tax. And the energy profits levy that eventually he came up with um, means that Shell is actually paying none of it in Britain. Now, we would reform that energy profits levy to make it a proper windfall tax. And we think by backdating it to January, when those windfall profits from war started to come into the coffers for those energy companies, extending it by an, an additional two years, closing some of those loopholes and putting up that tax rate so it is matches the level of taxes of energy companies in Norway, we believe that could bring in an additional £50 billion. So it doesn't just have to be heaping the pressure on ordinary working people, which is the message that we heard from Jeremy Hunt earlier in the programme. But all, Fairer but choices are possible. But there's always, Rachel Reeves, huge scepticism about what those taxes could actually bring in. And actually, we understand the government is also going to extend their windfall tax or energy profit, profit levy. They're probably going to put it up by 10% and apply it till 2028. So they are doing that. But you've well, they're said doing they... some of it, um, Laura. And I think this is really important because unless they get rid of those investment allowances, which mean that energy companies can offset more um, 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 investment in ex extraction of oil and gas in the North Sea against those taxes, you're still going to have a situation where some of those companies aren't actually paying the energy profits levy. It well, needs the companies to be a would obviously argue they need tax. to do that in order to invest in the North Sea so that we can keep the lights on. But this well, is what a, we a, really a... need to see is it investment in renewables because that is the cheapest form of energy. That will, is what will boost our energy security in Britain and get us to those net zero targets and create the thousands and thousands of well paid, secure jobs jobs here in Britain, which is what Labour's Green Prosperity Plan is all okay. about, because there are huge opportunities here. Okay. For as, we know, Rachel, and as we know, we've asked our viewers to give, provide us with their questions for you. We did that to Jeremy Hunt, and also we have a question for you from Brian Matthews. How does Labour explain rising interest rates and inflation in the US and Europe, in many cases worse than here? Our financial problems are primarily due to furlough, lockdown and Ukraine all spending that Labour supported. Windfall tax or not, we'd be in virtually the same budget hole under a Labour government, wouldn't we? What do you say to Brian? Of course there are global factors here. The Covid pandemic, the war in Ukraine. But we have been uniquely exposed here in Britain. We've been languishing in the global league tables for growth the last decade 
or so, which means that when these crises come along, we're not in a position to be able to deal with them. The last Labour government were able to invest in public services because the economy was growing by between two and two and a half percent. Over the last decade, we've been growing at just 1.4 percent on average, and that is lower than most of our um, international uh, competitors, which is why, as well as the fairer choices that I've started to set out, we also need that serious plan for growth, the Green Prosperity Plan, the reform to business rates to help our small businesses and high street businesses to thrive. The work we're doing to make Britain the best place to start and grow a business, but also some of the changes that we need to see to make Brexit work for Britain but do you by accept, sorting Rachel out some Reeves, of the holes in the deal that the government did. But do you accept, did. Rachel Reeves, that if you became Chancellor tomorrow, or if you're lucky enough to win the next election, do you accept as Chancellor you also would have to rein in public spending and put taxes up? Well, I've already set out some of those tax changes that an incoming Labour government would make. I do recognise that an incoming Labour government will not be able to do everything that we want as quickly as possible. And that is frustrating because the way that the government have managed our economy and our public finances this last decade uh, means that we've both got public services on their knees mm -hmm. and public finances in a mess. And an incoming Labour government will inherit that. Uh, I've set out a set of fiscal rules, as you know, mm -hmm. Laura, and that says that that, um, everything in our next manifesto will be fully costed and fully funded. So we recognise we're going to inherit this mess. It will put constraints um, on us. Um, but it's important that we get both the stability and security that we need in our economy. And we know from reports today that that failure to do that um, by the Conservatives has cost us £30 billion. But Rachel, uh, Reeves, pounds. But Rachel Reeves, you're rather trying to have but, but Rachel Reeves, you're rather trying to have it both ways, aren't you? Because you accept, actually, as the Conservatives do, that you would have to get a grip on public spending, you accept that you would have to put taxes up, and yet you also are saying that the way that the Conservatives are doing it is wrong. I mean, you're trying to have it both ways. And actually, on the left of your party, and some economists would dispute your view that you have to have your set of fiscal rules. In other words, some economists and some on the left would say, it doesn't matter that much if we keep borrowing mo that mo money for longer. You could pay the debt down over a much longer period. You could put taxes up much more. You don't have to take this approach. Well, look, I worked at the Bank of England before I became uh, an MP as an economist for many years, uh, and I recognise that there are restraints on what governments um, can do. Uh, now, a lot of these problems are because of mistakes that the government have made, but I recognise that it imposes constraints on an incoming uh, Labour government. But it's why it's so important that we have a serious plan for growing our economy and improving living standards of ordinary people. That will give us the money to invest in public services, but just because you have to make difficult decisions doesn't mean you have to make the same decisions and the decisions and the choices that Labour would be making would make our tax system uh, fairer and would grow the economy so that we've got those money for those essential public services that my constituents rely on, my family relies on and are frankly in a total mess today whether it's our schools or our NHS because of the decisions over the last decade. We've got 7 million people on hospital waiting lists. I don't think our NHS NHS has ever been um, in such a challenging position as it is today. An incoming Labour government, like the last government, the last Labour government, will tackle those challenges and will ensure we've got the support for public services. But I recognise that we won't be able to do everything we want as quickly as we want. That is frustrating, but that is the reality after 12 years of mismanagement by the Conservatives. Okay, well, let's talk then about who pays. So we have a question from another viewer, Ralph. Now, Ralph wants to know, we keep hearing about those with the broadest shoulders should bear the burden. Can anyone define this? How much does someone have to earn to be classified as someone with broad shoulders? Would Rachel Reeves, Labour, support what we think the government is going to do, which is make people pay the highest rate of tax from when they earn £125,000? Would you support that? Well, let's see what they do do, but I think it is reasonable to ask those on the highest incomes to pay a bit more in tax. But my key priority would be to crack down on some of the loopholes that we've got in our tax system. So, for example, you can make Britain your home, but not pay taxes here. And the non-DOM tax uh, status means that 70,000 people who have made Britain their home are not paying their fair share tax in but Britain. And that is about... costing us, let me just say this, this is costing us £3.2 billion a year. So Labour would 
end that non-DOM tax status uh, to ensure that we're getting those tax revenues from everybody that makes Britain their home. But what Ralph wants to know, and I'm sure other viewers do, is who do you define as somebody who should pay more tax? Now, non-DOMs, you've set out your policy, but that is a, 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 niche, a niche group of the population. What about a, a head teacher? a highly paid head teacher, as some of them are, earning £100,000. Do they have broad shoulders? Would they pay more tax under a Labour government? Labour have got no proposals to increase um, rates of income tax or, or, or national insurance. In, in fact, it's the Tories who have been increasing uh, taxes on working people. We think that if you get your tax from uh, stocks and shares and dividends or through buy-to-let properties, there is a case for looking at how those that income is taxed, because at the moment it is taxed at a much lower rate than income come from going out to work. There are so many loopholes in the system that means the system is, is not fair and often those with the most resources are able to get out of paying their fair share of tax. Look at the private equity industry for example. Private equity bosses say that their income is capital gains and so pay 28% tax rather than 45% tax on but it. Rachel, that is not the... right and we would close that loophole. But do you believe that you would be able to raise all the tax that you needed to pay for the public services that you want? from closing loopholes. I think there's an awful lot you can get at. The windfall tax, the global minimum rate of corporation tax, the non-DOM uh, changes, those are just some of the proposals that Labour have put forward uh, to, to um, close some of the gap in the public finances. But the point is, and I guess the difference between Labour and the Conservatives, is that the Tories keep coming back to working people and asking them to pay more and they do little to close these loopholes that mean some of the wealthiest people and businesses in society are still not paying their fair share but are of you taxes. That's the change morning, I want to see. But are you guaranteeing, Rachel Reeves, this morning that people would, you would not put income tax up? Is that what you're saying? I'm not going to write my manifesto for the Labour Party on this programme, Laura, but I've got no um, uh, plans to increase uh, income tax. In fact, it's Jeremy Hunt, through his stealth taxes, that is increasing income taxes because he's not willing or not able to tackle some of these loopholes that see um, some people in society not paying their fair share of tax. And that is the difference between what Jeremy Hunt will be doing on Thursday and what I would be doing if I was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Now, if you were a Chancellor, what would you do about an issue a lot of people are very interested in, climate change? Um, last week here on this programme, Ed Miliband said that a Labour government would pay compensation to countries that are being terribly affected already by environmental damage and those who haven't been big emitters in the past but who are now suffering. How much would you spend on that? Well, look, there's already global agreement to help those countries that are most affected um, by uh, climate change. And, and that is right. But I think the biggest contribution that the UK can make is to get in um, um, plan our own um, things we can do here in Britain to get to net zero as quickly as possible. And, and that has a number of benefits. First of all, it actually reduces the price of energy for British consumers because we know that renewable energy is the cheapest form. It boosts our energy security and makes us less reliant on Putin and other dictatorial regimes. And through that investment, we can create those good quality, well-paid, secure jobs all across Britain in carbon capture in green hydrogen, in uh, floating offshore wind, in green steel, jobs of the future paying good wages in former industrialised communities and in our coastal communities. And it gets us to net zero and playing our role uh, and, uh, in the global field in getting to net zero and passing on to our children and grandchildren a green and inhabitable uh, planet. But it has the huge benefit of ensuring good quality jobs here in Britain. And I want to seize those opportunities because some Rachel country Reeves. in the world is going to be the global leader in these industries and it can and should be Britain. Rachel Reeves, thank you so much for joining us on the programme this morning. I'm sure in the run-up to the election in the next weeks and months we'll talk a lot more about those plans you were just outlining there but thank you very much for being thank with you. us this weekend. Now, I reckon every Sunday is special. We get to have these kind of big conversations about what's going on in the world. But this Sunday, every year, is a special conversation. It's a moving and sombre moment. The service of remembrance live from the Cenotaph starts straight after this show on BBC One. And a familiar face on Sunday morning, Sophie Rayworth, is there for us today. Good morning from the Cenotaph in a very misty Whitehall. And what a morning it is going to be. 9,750 veterans. That's how many are expected to take part in the March Pass today. One of the biggest that we have seen 
in many years. And also the public. 10,000 people are expected to gather here in Whitehall. They're arriving now. Many of them have been waiting since 7 o'clock this morning to make sure that they can be here to take their places and watch the march past. Well, I'm joined by a man who has been here many times and will be marching again today, Terry Bullingham, who is marching with Blind Veterans UK. And Terry, lovely to see you. It's particularly nice poignant you. for you, isn't it? Because it is the 40th anniversary of the Falklands War in which you served. Yes. And I was on the HMS Antrim, County Class Destroyer, looking after Humphrey, the embarked anti-submarine helicopter. And we were in San Carlos water, 21st of May, protecting, protecting Canberra as he's starting to disembark the troops. And we had uh, four Skyhawks did a low pass over us, bombed us, but they, they didn't go off, thank goodness. And at the same time, preoccupied or on the flight deck, two Argentinian Mirage fighters came down, probably 500 knots, 50 feet, incredible sort of speed. And the last thing I actually saw was a star on the side of them and, uh, and the cannon shown in the water pointing at me. And I got uh, shrapnel in my eyes and I totally black blind ever since. What does it mean to you to be here today? It's an absolute privilege. The atmosphere the, that we, of course, you know, viewers aren't going to pick that up, but, but to actually be here is a privilege and hear the, hear the Big Ben strike at 11. Wonderful. And I think of lots of people from the Falklands and from uh, uh, um, Afghanistan and uh, Iraq, but mainly from the Falklands, Fleet Iron people. HMS Glamorgan, which was our sister ship, took her exit set in the hangar uh, to, on the 12th of June, just before the end. And I lost six good friends there. And there were other Fleet Iron people who died. And I met people from two para, three para, uh, really involved. And, and we had a comradeship, is yeah. You come back here year after year, don't you? I think mm. more than 30 years you have, have come, but particularly important to be here this year. Yes, yes. Well, I marched with the, with the uh, Blind Veterans Contingent. I'm proud to march with them. They, give me, they gave me my life back, back in 1982, taught me to read Braille, taught me to type. Men didn't type back in 1982, and uh, taught me to get around with a long cane. And uh, without that training, I'd have been up the creek without a paddle. So I'm always grateful to them. Terry Bullingham, thank you so much for talking to thank us this you, morning. Sophie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, one of the most important people at that ceremony later will be the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radican. He was here a little earlier. Okay. Um, Admiral Sir Tony, thank you for coming in. This will be the first Remembrance Sunday that Her Majesty the Queen won't be there. Will it be different? It will be a little different, but much of it is the same. This is an enormous moment for the nation every year. It involves the whole nation, so clearly in London, but also Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, all of our cities, our towns, our villages, all around the globe. And it's a special moment where we pause, we reflect, and I think it does have additional poignancy, particularly with the loss of Her Majesty the Queen. She represented duty and service, but also that dignity of that wartime generation and all that they sacrificed for our freedom. And I think there's the additional poignancy that once again we have war in Europe. So it's always a special day, but especially this today. And her presence will be notably absent but of course many others of that generation that wartime generation are also passing away just because of the, the passage of time do you think it becomes harder for people to remember does it become harder for people now to understand what the sacrifices really meant as that as we lose that generation potentially it does but I think there's been an enormous effort to, to educate. I love the programmes within schools where they're taught what this really means. I think all of us have family stories and we know our own stories about our relatives that served. And then I also think it goes beyond the First World War and the Second World War. We've got to acknowledge the sacrifice in the conflicts that came afterwards, whether that was Korea, whether that's Iraq, Afghanistan, Northern Ireland, 
there is a continual commitment and sacrifice in order to preserve our freedom, our self-determination, the values that we cherish. You mentioned there a poignancy about today's services because there is again war in Europe. Now, it's not so long that you were here last time and we discussed how Ukraine at that point was making success in the northeast of the country, pushing back. We've seen in the last few days them retaking the city of Kherson and we can see some of the images of people responding as soldiers go in and liberate that city. What do you think this victory for Ukraine means in terms of the war? We're seeing a continued failure by Russia. We saw that at the outset. Russia wanted to take the cities, it failed. Russia wanted to subjugate Ukraine, it's failed and it's failing dramatically. Russia wanted to weaken NATO and NATO's even stronger. And then if you come down to the tactical fight, we're seeing continued success by Ukraine. When I was last on, it was Kharkiv, and the ingenuity and determination of the Ukrainian people to, to win their country back again. And now you're seeing that in Kherson, and you will continue to see the strength and resolve of the Ukrainian people to defeat Russia. And our job is to support Ukraine and to support them politically, diplomatically, militarily. And you can see on the faces of people in that city as their own troops arrive to liberate them, just how much it means. But in terms of the progress of the war, is this a very significant turning point? Does this change things? Does this mean that Russia is losing? Russia is losing. Russia has been losing from the very outset. I'm wary of turning point language. Mm. This is a messy, protracted conflict, and the likelihood is that it's going to continue to be a messy, protracted conflict. And so Ukraine can take some tactical gains in Kharkiv. It's a significant gain with Kherson and all that Kherson represents. But there will be ebbs and flows throughout this war. If Ukraine has the momentum, though, does that potentially I mean, it's a moment where with that momentum, they could go to the negotiating table. Your opposite number in the States, General Mark Milley, has made that case, we understand, that actually the Ukrainians should now be thinking about negotiating. Do you agree with that? So I think these are decisions for President Zelensky. I think we've been really clear. We support Ukraine. It's Ukraine that's been invaded. It's Ukraine that's fighting for its freedom. We're on Remembrance Day. And we have a country in Europe that's been illegally invaded and we have a population fighting like crazy to get their nation back again. And that's why we've got to be respectful and acknowledge that it's President Zelensky mm -hmm. who's going to determine for his nation when is the right negotiating point. Does that mean, though, though that there is obviously some suggestion of that from the United States side? are you saying from the UK there is no push and no suggestion to Ukraine that they should go to the table? All, all I'm saying from the UK's point of view is I don't think this, that there is any change with Herzog. I think the UK has always supported President Zelensky. What steps do you think Putin might take? I mean one of the problems for the West here is that he's an unpredictable leader. There has been a lot of perhaps loose talk about dangling a nuclear threat. But what other steps could he take? What other steps do you think he might take now? I think he's under pressure. I think you're seeing some desperate moves with the mobilisation. But I also think he's rational. You saw in those early days the ambition to take the cities. He was defeated. He dropped back. The ambition to take most of the territory of Ukraine he was defeated, he dropped back. He then reoriented his forces. You saw the ambition to, to, to annex the, the oblast, that's failed. You saw he's take, he took Kherson as a provincial capital, that's failed. He, Russia still behaves in a rational way. Part of the challenge for Russia, part of the reason it's gone so wrong is, as you've alluded to, that very solid support from the West, including from the UK. Now, in terms of the UK's capability to support countries like Ukraine, to take action on the world stage, there is pressure 
on budgets. We're hearing from the Chancellor how difficult things may be. I understand you and the Defence Secretary went to see the Prime Minister and the Chancellor this week to talk about money. Um, what do you need? And if you do not get rises in terms of inflation, what would that mean for our capability around the world? We, we need continued investment, and, and that's continued investment over the long term. And I welcome the conversations that we can have with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and, and accompanying the Defence Secretary. These are incredibly serious times. They're serious economic times, but they're also serious security times with a war in Europe. And both of those have to be dealt with. And when you look at the security aspect, these are long-term threats and they require long-term investment. It sounds like you are quite carefully trying to say the long-term budgets for the MOD must not be cut. For the ambition of the government to be met, we need to maintain that investment. And the Defence Secretary has been very clear about that and I think the government's been very clear about its own ambition to respond to the threats that are out there and to have a stronger defence. I also want to ask you about something the Defence Secretary talked about in the Commons this week. He revealed a British RAF plane on patrol over the Black Sea in September was interacted with, um, whatever that really means, by Russian aircraft. Now, he said that a Russian aircraft released a missile in the vicinity of a British plane. You may not be able to tell us very much, but that sounds like something very serious. Can you tell us what really happened? I won't, I won't go into the detail of that, but it's, it's again, it's a reflection that when we have this close interaction between Russia and NATO forces, we have to maintain our professionalism. We have to maintain our commitment to fulfil our task, but to avoid miscalculations. And, 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 and both of us have to have the right communication between our nations to ensure that we don't have miscalculations. And, and, and there, was, there was a potential risk of a miscalculation in that scenario. And fortunately, it was averted. These cases are abhorrent. They, they are not our values. They're not the values that we're reflecting on on Remembrance Day and the sacrifice and integrity of those that have gone before us. And there is no place for that abuse in our services. And we've got to root it out. We've got to be really clear with our leadership. We've got to give the confidence to those that, that are abused or do feel threatened or concerned that we will, we will deal with that and they can have the confidence to report it. And we've done a whole series of measures so we've, we've strengthened our, 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 our relationship with our networks to try to understand better what, what, what are some of the things that have gone on in the past. We are just introducing a zero tolerance in the same way that we have for drugs. If, you, if you're caught taking drugs, you're kicked out of the armed forces. If you're caught in, in any kind of situation where you have abused somebody and there's a sexual nature to that, we will kick you out. And that, to me, is the right response. But we recognise that we have to deal with this because it's, this is, these are people that are impugning our values and the things that we stand for and the things that our nation expects of us. OK. Admiral Sir Tony, thanks so much for coming in again. And we hope that the service later on today goes well. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. The Chief of the Defence Staff, Tony Radican, here in the studio a little bit earlier this morning. Now, at quarter past ten, we'll join the Remembrance Service live at the Cenotaph. But before we do that, let's take a look back at important information that we heard today from the Chancellor. We are going to see uh, everyone paying more tax. We're going to see spending cuts. Uh, but I think it's very important to say that we are a resilient country and we're also a compassionate country. We'll make sure that we protect the most vulnerable. I think that might be the headline in some of the newspapers tomorrow. But we've also heard, importantly, from Labour this morning. Paul Johnson, do you think Labour's position here is credible? Does it add up? I, I took two things from that interview with Rachel Reeves. The first, really encouragingly, as she recognises there are serious constraints on what Labour can do, that, 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 that there's not um, whatever spending they want and that taxes 
uh, is going to have to rise if they want to increase spending and everything won't happen immediately. So there's a recognition of constraints rather as Jeremy Hunt was saying. The thing that I was slightly less convinced by was the indication that all of that could be paid for by closing loopholes and taxing corporations and so on. Yes there are definitely things you can do to make the tax system better and fairer by changing things like capital gains tax mm. and the taxation of land and dividends and, and housing and inheritance and all those things. Uh, but uh, you can't close the whole whole the whole hole like that. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do it just by taxing yeah. corporates. I mean, we're already getting corporation tax probably to its highest level in history in this yeah, country. Yeah, so there's going to be continued pressure so on Labour to not, spell out whether that's realistic. You can't just do it by taxing someone else, yeah. which is the indication we got. Rula Kalaf, I know you were listening with interest to what Tony Radican was saying about Ukraine. Brief word from you on that. I'm very interested in what he said about the messy protracted conflict and because I am starting to wonder given all the um, uh, the victories and I think it occurs, taking to Curzon is a milestone whether the Ukrainians aren't going to win you're starting now to hear voices from the West saying perhaps it's time for negotiations mm -hmm. but I don't see what room there is today for negotiations okay. situation doesn't allow for that negotiations. That debate could evolve in the next while. Um, Simon, finally to you, it's been great to have you here in the studio this morning. Um, and I know you, as a historian, have a new big historical project, a new TV programme called The History of Now. Tell us about it. It is, it's really, um, it, it, it ponders the notion that actually a lot of the great themes, um, be it what we were talking about earlier on, the, how raw can capitalism be without a social conscience? You know, how, how will that help democracy live? Civil rights. Um, this has been Rovember in America, as predicted. Um, the notion that second wave feminism could, had won irreversibly, you know, was reversed by the Supreme Court. So the, the programs deal with these things that happened during my lifetime and how the arts and culture, we've been talking politics, mm -hmm. that's your job, Laura. But <laughs> I want to say, especially in light of cuts, the arts are not a luxury. We feature George Orwell, James Baldwin, Ai Weiwei. They change minds. Poems can't stop tanks, but wow, they can change history. That's what the series is about. Well, that big idea is in a big conversation and viewers can look forward to that on BBC Two from Sunday the 27th of November. Yes. Yeah. yes. Thank you so much to all three of you for being here this morning and helping us through some chunky debates and grappling with some big issues. And we know one thing now, we are all going to be paying more tax and the public services that millions rely on are going to be hard pressed. I think we're seeing the backdrop for the next election emerge, an argument over how to make the best of a bad situation for the economy. Maybe not so much a struggle for hearts and minds. We will see. As ever, you can catch up on anything you've missed this morning on the iPlayer later, but let's call time now for now on the political battles. I think Simon might already have done that. But as I promised you we would do on this programme, on occasion we will bring you something unashamedly beautiful to savour. Now, the last post always signifies the end of the day, but today on Remembrance Sunday, it maybe has a special resonance. So let's hear an incredible version of that piece of music just for you. So before we cross to the Cenotaph for the Remembrance Sunday service, I'm delighted to leave you with the pianist Alexis French and the trumpeter Aaron Akubo. I'll see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>